Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bife here. So, when talking about the King's Fall raid, it's hard not to talk about the touch of malice. Destiny has many notorious exotic weapons, but there are a few that have had such a huge impact on the lore. I have a feeling that only a few others, such as the likes of Yalahorn, Thorn, The Last Word, and a few storied others can claim to have a better story, but Touch of Malice almost certainly has one of the longest of any weapon in Destiny. Maybe only Lubre's Ruin has a longer history. Touch of Malice is an exotic that was created by Eris Morn, but it's also a devious plan that has come to fruition after millions of years of preparation. In a strange way, Oryx and Eris came to create the Touch of Malice in collaboration. Their goals of inflicting pain were aligned. Their determination to build the weapon was complete and unstoppable. Their retribution would be one of our most powerful boons. Today we're going to tell the tale of this dreadful weapon, one that we now also seem to know as a weapon of sorrow. So, where does the story of the Touch of Malice begin? Well, it starts with the Books of Sorrow, long, long ago. The Books of Sorrow has a rather odd structure to it because of its final chapters. You see, it seems like Oryx and the Hive will be at their most victorious in these last few moments, but when their greatest victory thus far against the Gift Mast is underway, it is interrupted. Savathun and Shuvor Rath at that moment tell Oryx that they will have to depart from him because his power is beginning to overshadow theirs and they need time to develop in separation from him to grow their own strength. This is a moment that leaves Oryx with much time to reflect, and the last few chapters of the Books of Sorrow as a result change pace. They become more reflective and become almost more like the musings of a god on his place in the universe. There are many important things in these last few chapters, but those relevant to today come from the final two entries, Worm Food and insight. These chapters are of great importance because they reveal Oryx's motives in these most dark and recent hours to our story, in the moments before he recently arrived in Sol. This, of course, was all canonically before the Taken King expansion and not before the Season of the Plunder. Remember, when it comes to the Season of the Plunder and the returning raids, Bungie likes to treat these as moments frozen in time. We are effectively traveling back seven years in time to the moment when we invaded the Dreadnought's depths. So keep that in mind, this is not contemporary lore, it's actually rather old in comparison. Worm Food reads as follows. What will happen if I die? It suits me to consider this, for I am a great ally of death. My daughters study the quiddity of death, my son practices the inhabitation of death, and my great work is, in Ultima, to become synonymous with death. To die and, in that dying, live, so that if the universe comes to nothing, then I will be a part of that nothing. Far better to have a savage universe with a happy end than a happy universe with no hope. I have died many times, but these deaths were only temporary. If my echoes are killed, if I am killed in the material world, then I will be driven back to my throne, the Dreadnought. If my court and my throne can be beaten, if I am confronted in my throne, if I am defeated there, then I will die. My work will end. This is the pact to which I am bound, in particular by my study of the Tablets of Ruin and by my use of the power of the Deep. When I call upon that power, I put myself up as the stakes in a wager. I gamble with my soul. For I am saying, listen, my gods. I am the mightiest thing there is, and I prove it thus. Lately, I have realized how much I depend on Crota and my daughters, and even upon my court. If I lost them, if my outlays would exceed my intakes, my tribute would not be enough to feed my worm. But this is proper. For if I lost them, it would be because they are not mighty enough. And then, I would be a bad father, a bad king. I must test them, and fight with them, and keep them strong. This is my geish. I will go on forever. I will understand everything. There is only one path, and that is the path that you make. But you can make more than one path. Break yourselves, bars. Make a new shape. 
Make the shape from its path. Find your cell's bars. Break out of the bars. Find a shape. Make the shape from its path. Eat the light. Eat the path. If I fail, let me be worm food. And following on from this, we have the final chapter of the Books of Sorrow, which only unlocks after you've found all the others. It is the insight, and it reads as follows. I have made preparations. If I am defeated, I know it will be because my understanding of the universe was incomplete. I failed to anticipate some strategy, some nemesis, perhaps Teox if she still lives. If I am defeated, I know that I will fall to something mighty. Something that craves might, something that loves what I love, which is the deep. A principle and a power, the versatile protean need to adapt and endure, to reach out and shape the universe entirely for that purpose, to mutate and redesign and test and iterate so that it can prevail, can seize existence and hold it, certain that this is everything, that there is nothing to life except living. And it has two faces, yet it is one shape. One face is the objective, which is obvious, and the other face is that will to sacrifice things and ideas for a single mission. The mission of becoming the shape, a shape that will not relent. The utter commitment to survival, to draw the right sword and choose where to cut, to allow this hunger to become your weapon. So I will prepare a book, which is a map to a weapon. And my vanquisher will read that book, seeking the weapon. And they will come to understand me, where I have been and where I was going. And then they will take up my weapon and they will use it. They will use that weapon, which is all that I am. And thus armed with my past and my future and my present, which is a weapon, a weapon that takes whatever is available, a weapon bound to malice, they will mantle me, Oryx, the Taken King. They will become me and I will become them, each of us defeating the other, correcting the other, alloying ourselves into one omnipotent philosophy. Thus, I will live forever. I'll make sure. This was Oryx's plan. He created the calcified fragments. He created them to catalogue the history of the Krill and the Hive, the Books of Sorrow, to provide the pathway of understanding to his past, to understand the Hive in their entirety, to understand their future and where the sword logic would lead them, and to understand how to make his present a weapon that he spoke of, one bound in malice. And this is where the story of Destiny 1's Taken King expansion really comes into play, you see, we built this weapon. This weapon would be the Touch of Malice, and the entirety of the quest to obtain the Touch of Malice tells us much more about this process. You see, in the Destiny 2 version of King's Fall, you just get Touch of Malice as a random drop from the final chest. Destiny 1's version of the Touch of Malice was acquired through a quest which proceeds as follows. First of all, you would have to complete the King's Fall raid, and in doing so, kill Oryx. By doing so, you would also acquire three items. From the War Priest, you would acquire the Blade of Famine, which you would see as the bayonet on the end of the Touch of Malice. From the Daughters of Oryx, you would acquire the Shroud of Uranuk, the Weaver, which covers the frame of the Touch of Malice. And from Oryx himself, we would obtain the Ravenous Heart, which lies at the center of the machine, something which is a source of its boundless power and its will to consume. As best we know, this is the heart of Oryx. It is the embodiment of him that he spoke of, that is at the center of the weapon. Together, these fragments need to be recovered, but they alone would not be enough to forge the Touch of Malice. The knowledge required to build the Touch of Malice could only be obtained by obtaining the calcified fragments throughout the Dreadnought, those that had specifically been left by Oryx, not only as a history of the Hive, as a map to the Touch of Malice. Once enough of them had been acquired, in particular 45 out of the 50 of them, the process of crafting the weapon could truly begin. Eros would require substantial materials from the Dreadnought in order to create the weapon's frame, including worm spore, weapon parts, and an abundance of hadium flakes. 
all materials that could indeed be used to create a terrible weapon of hive design, a weapon of sorrow. Hadium in particular is important to note for the weapon's construction because it is capable of containing the paracausal energies reflected by the environment around it. Having this in proximity to the ravenous heart pulled straight from Oryx's remains would mean that the weapon's frame would be one radiating darkness. Eris, however, would require more from us. In particular, it seems we would need to fill in some of the missing knowledge that Oryx had specifically left amongst his legions of Taken. We would need to seek out a Taken knight known as Morgath, the Lawkeeper, who at this time was residing with the Taken that had invaded the Black Garden on Mars. We would find Morgath, this Taken Knight Lawkeeper, within the forces of the Undying Mind in the Black Garden, and upon killing him, Eris would have one final task for us. We would need to return to where our excursions against the Taken King had begun, to Mars's moon of Phobos. In the mission called Fear's Embrace, we would be forced to fight a Shade of Oryx, but also a Taken wizard known as Marzik, the Blight Caller. Upon the death of the wizard, we would finally have all that we needed to complete the weapon known as the Touch of Malice. Before handing it to us, Eris would have a moment to contemplate her actions. It's worth remembering and understanding the story of Eris, because at this point, she is doing something remarkable as a character. It is worth remembering that she has lost everything she has to the Hive. Her fire team and many of the guardians that fell in the Great Disaster were all her friends, but more than that, She's lost her ghost Briar, her chances at a happy future, and even the eyes that had all been stolen from her by the Hive. The Osmium Dynasty has wronged Eris a thousand times over, and her vengeance knows no limits. As the Bane of Crota, she brought about the death of the Son of Oryx, and now had brought ruin through her guardian agents to those residing in his court, his priest of war, his beastly abomination Golgoroth, his two daughters, and even to the Taken King himself. She was the Hive Bane, the Bane of Oryx, and all those that stood in the name of the Taken King and ravaged the worlds of Sol. She hates the Hive with all her being, and she is willing to enact every possible vengeance upon them. But she has also read the Books of Sorrow by this point, and she knows very well that building this weapon, the Touch of Malice, plays into Oryx's ultimate plan. In a way, it allows Oryx to survive. She knows that by building the Touch of Malice, she is playing to the whims of a Hive God and allowing its ruinous power to persist as long as the Guardian continues to wield it. So what is Eris to choose? Is she to seek vengeance? Or to deny the God that she has hunted its last wish? A choice is explained in the lore tab of the Touch of Malice, which is the same as the lore found within the Grimoire card for the same exotic weapon, and a happy moment for this, by the way. Seven years later, yet again, some of the lore from Destiny 1 has actually made it into the game. It makes you smile, remembering that these were once little bits of lore on Bungie.net, and now they are much more accessible to everyone. The lore tab for the Touch of Malice reads as follows. Here am I, with the power to craft from my enemy's darkest secrets a weapon that could wound them to their core. So, what stays my hand? When I behold the interiority of these cold, cold fragments, I see blind, squirming creatures. Every wound they give, they feel also upon themselves. Every bite they tear from the light only deepens, never fills the raging emptiness behind their terrible mouths. The voices are as loud as ever. My nightmares just as bitter. My cold, black hatred burns as hot. But I feel something else now. Could it be? No. I refuse it. I will build this weapon. The flavor text of this weapon, which I believe is stated at the very end when Eris has constructed the Touch of Malice, reads, Let them feel every lash, every curse, every touch of malice that they first dealt to me. It's not clear to me, but I think in those last minutes, Eris's consideration and understanding of the Hive's story made her feel pity 
but that pity was so easily erased by all her pain. She understands that she is working to the whims of a hive god now, and she doesn't care, because the hive god does not discriminate against its own kind when it comes to enforcing the pain that it can bring with the touch of malice. She resolved to build the weapon and to gift it to us. With this, she began the long-honored tradition that Guardians had enacted, which is to take our greatest enemies and to turn them into weapons, a tradition that was also enacted with Zol and Savathun's parasitic worm. More importantly, she would have preserved the Taken King, Oryx, for all time. So long as the weapon persisted, so too would an echo of his truth. It would continue Oryx's objective of bringing the final shape into being. In a certain manner, the Taken King is still amongst us, thanks to the touch of malice. Its latest iteration within Destiny 2 reflects the lore of the weapon quite well. The Touch of Mercy note, which originally was on Destiny 1, is somehow still there, now rolled into the Touch of Malice perk. It's something that allows you to enact as the hive would the requirement of killing for sustenance. The weapon allows the wielder to deal an incredible amount of damage when it is out of ammunition. However, it will not go to zero rounds. It will allow you to continue to shoot, but it will drain your own life force, starting with your shields, in return for not consuming your last round of ammunition. Doing so means the weapon will deal even more damage, and killing targets in quick succession is a reward for enacting the sword logic and will heal you. The touch of malice Draining the wielder's life force is something that was on Destiny 1's version of the weapon as well, with only the aura of immortality from King's Fall being a remedy to this. But there's also something new. The Charged with Blight perk will blind and weaken enemies that are hit with the Charged Blight round that is shot. It looks as a typical Captain Blight projectile does, but more importantly, it weakens enemies that are hit with it against a very specific kind of weapon, a weapon of sorrow. These are weapons imbued with dark magics of the Hive that are also built with humanity's mastery of war. It goes some way to confirming the idea that Touch of Malice is indeed a weapon of sorrow, just like Thorn and its newer cousin, the Osteostriga. There are few weapons with a legacy as long as this one. Perhaps only Lubre's Ruin, the weapon once known as Relic's Bane, is equally storied and it has cracked entire worlds in half. Who knows what the touch of malice will accomplish when wielded by guardian hands. It too may at some point create a power so great that worlds will tremble and gods will fall. But that's all from me for now. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did, go ahead and leave a like. Of course, remember that if you want more Destiny content on King's Fall and Season of the Plunder, you can hit the subscribe button and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. I'm still looking for what you guys want to hear about King's Fall next. I have a script lined up on the War Priest, but I imagine there are others such as the Daughters of Oryx, Golgoroth, and some other general questions that you want answered. I also have a video talking about some rather remarkable circumstances, which inadvertently means that Shivor Wrath might have led to the murder of Oryx, and I can get that video sorted for you as well. Just let me know what you guys want down below in the comments section. In the meantime though, know that as per usual, your viewership is quite enough for me, and that my name has been, my name is Bife, Porodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.